Norwegians do not see color. <laughs> this is a phrase that I have heard so many times in conversations with friends, colleagues, and even random strangers. But I'm pretty sure that if we all look around us, at least when you look at me, you can see color. You can see that my hair is brownish and my eyes are not blue. But this phrase suggests something much more interesting, much more important. Norwegians do not care about race. This is usually qualified with a rather apologetic statement that of course there is racism in Norway, a kind of raceless racism that discriminates on the basis of religion or aesthetics or more generally culture. Let's assume this is how things are. For sure, we don't find racial categories in official documents here, and the Norwegian state does not collect data on race when we enroll in the universities, the healthcare system, or for the census. But then, why is it important to discuss race in Norway today, and especially race as biology? I think there are two important reasons for doing so. First, the intense human mobility, which is often seen as threatening to societies perceived as homogeneous and prospering. I'm quite sure that after the refugee crisis reached Norway, your social media accounts <coughs> featured ver various stories in which Norwegians with a darker, darker skin tone were publicly harassed and asked to go back home. A second reason why I think this is important. The contemporary discussions on the usefulness and meaningfulness of race for medicine. I often meet, meet geneticists or people who know a geneticist or have read an article on genetics who suggest that race must be important for medicine. So we're confronted with encountering human diversity more and more in our everyday lives and with what's supposed to, what is supposed to be an easier access to what is happening within scientific labs. And this is why I think it is very important to rethink the significance of the following three statements. Race has always been and continues to be an inaccurate and crude tool to describe human biological variation. Race has always been and continues to be socially significant, affecting the ways we perceive each other and we perceive ourselves. And relatedly, differential treatment of people based on racial criteria affects their lives, including their health. <coughs> Does this mean that we are not different? Of course not. We are all similar and different in many interesting ways. My talk today deals only with one kind of difference, human biological variation. What we have known about it for decades, and then what has and has not changed based on our contemporary insights from genetics. So let's start with what we have known. At least since the second part of the 21st century, most anthropologists and geneticists have stopped using race to describe human biological variation. Instead, they have suggested that human genomes are very similar. At the same time, like in every other single species, there are these small variations from individual to individual, which are called polymorphisms. So humans are very similar, but also different. Some of this variation can be seen with our naked eyes, and some of it can be found deep under our skin, within our genetic makeup. But how should then one describe this kind of variation? Does it come in specific patterns? Scientists asked. I think there are two important answers to these questions that we need to keep in mind. First, changes in human characteristics do not follow racial groupings. Human traits change gradually and continuously following geographical gradients, like this one that you see in this picture. What does this mean? Let's think about 
human skin color, one of our most visible characteristics and the one that is most usually uh, associated with race. <coughs> Contemporary studies have shown that skin color, which is controlled by a complex set of genes, is highly adaptive. As groups of humans started moving away from equatorial Africa, our, our skin color differentiated gradually. We no longer needed to produce high, level of mel high levels of melanin to adapt to the high levels of UV radiation around the equator. Today, one can find all sorts of different colors all around the Earth. Cultural adaptations, such as sunbathing or protect protective clothing, have allowed people with a lighter skin tone to live closer to the, to the equator. Like skin color, most human traits change gradually and come in many different patterns. This makes it obvious that there is no one way to divide up humans. Race is not a natural category. Any boundaries we impose on human biological variation are artificial and arbitrary. We just make them up. Second answer to these questions that we need to keep in mind, and this is especially important for medical purposes. A large part of this variation is re just a response to local conditions. I come from the Mediterranean, a malaria-stricken area such as West Africa, the Middle East, and India. This puts me in a higher risk for sickle cell anemia. Why? Because individuals who carry one of the variants of sickle cell anemia have a selective advantage. We are protected against malaria. Yet, sickle cell anemia has until very recently been seen as a racial disease, a disease of black people, an African disease. If a doctor used my skin color as a shortcut to my race, and my race as a shortcut for my uh, medical risks, then I would run the danger of being misdiagnosed. In such cases, knowing one's origins or ancestry is medically relevant, but again has nothing to do with traditional classifications, with traditional, understand traditional understandings of race. So let's now see what has changed in our understandings of human biological variation. Has the new genetic technologies re-established race? The answer is no. In the early 2000s, when the reference human genome was sequenced, the scientists involved announced that humans are 99.9% .9 similar in their genetic composition, leaving only 0.1% for variation. The human species is one and remarkably genetically homogeneous, they said. And we also now know that the first, anatomi the, the first anatomically modern humans originated in Africa, and as they started moving out of Africa, they carried with them only a subset of that original variation. Genetic studies keep confirming also that human variation follows a gradual distribution over geographical space, reflecting adaptation and selection, just as in the cases of human skin color and sickle cell anemia. But it also reflects another simple fact. Humans tend to mate with people who are closer to, get to them, irrespective of any kind of boundaries cultural or otherwise, populations living together are more genetically similar. But as human mobility increases and becomes easier, even the variation that we find today will eventually decrease even more. So if this is what we know from contemporary science, then why we may think that race is not dead yet? I believe there are two important sources of confusion. First, scientific and popular science discussions which use outdated racial labels 
such as Caucasoid, Negroid, or Mongoloid. These uses reinforce folk ideas about the existence of races. A second source of confusion. Even if limited in numbers, there are still scientists who would argue that racial groupings are medically relevant. They are useful in describing human biological variation and in reconstructing human migration routes. But what are researchers investigating human genetic diversity actually able to do today? They have the capacity to gather large amounts of data on all sorts of DNA markers found in that 0.1% of variation and group humans into clusters. And in that way, they sometimes are able to connect individuals with specific geographic areas. So these groupings now that they make could be four, five, six, ten, or twenty, depending on the software uh, used or what the researchers ask or are looking for. But it has never been the case that human genetic diversity has uniquely been described in a fixed number of clusters. So when we hear researchers report to the press that genetics has shown that humans can be grouped in five or six main geographical regions. What are they doing? Is the privileging of five or six groups what they think makes sense to them, to the press and the public, just because of our racial preconceptions? If yes, then this sense-making is not biological. It's purely cultural. We are simply used to understand human biological variation in terms of race. It has been there for decades, it's convenient, and it's easy. While some researchers repeat that these groupings simply reflect our human history, our migration history, their emphasis on these broad areas, such as Europe, Africa, or Asia, is remarkably and dangerously close to traditional racial classifications. And they need to be aware and reminded of what they may be suggesting. With several of these considerations in mind, in a very recent ar uh, article in the uh, journal Science, the authors explicitly argue that using race to describe human biological variation is potentially harmful. Instead, they encourage scientific journals and societies to use the term ancestry in human studies. Indeed, ancestry, as a shortcut to geographic origins, is a much less loaded term. But still, neither ancestry nor geography are social innocents. They both reflect deeply rooted cultural understandings and they require specific clarifications in terms of space and time. For example, I come from Greece, which puts my origins in the Mediterranean and the Balkans and also Europe. But at the same time, as our family history suggests, we may also have Jewish ancestry. So when I must to declare my ancestry, when and where should I stop? and what implications its, answers may, its answer may have. My point is rather simple. The study of human variation at the level of genetics could lead to interesting outcomes with regards to our health risks and could also shed light on the human migration history. But the more we cover our contemporary insights with the very old clothes of race, or in obscure categories such as ancestry, the more irrelevant and detrimental they become. There is much more to gain if we focus on the individual when it comes to medical diagnosis and treatment. And there is much more to gain from a nuanced dialogue between the sciences and the humanities when it comes to understanding human past. I have been a scientist 
And as a historian, I have been researching the history of physical anthropology, racial science, and human population genetics for many years. And I know very well that the persistence of the concept of race has nothing to do with how accurately it describes human biological variation. Race has never been just about biology. It has been a tool of suppression coming out of our colonial encounters and an, instru and an instrument for social certification. Race is simply a social and historical category. And here comes my final example. When my great-grandfather was entering the U.S. in the beginnings of the 20th century, he was not seen as belonging to the same racial group as the white European Anglo-Saxons. He was seen as belonging to this mischievous, untrustworthy, inferior Mediterranean race. And he was treated in an analogous way. He was given certain jobs under certain conditions. This very long history of racial thinking shows that there are no silver bullets to kill race. What we can do, though, is be explicit and open about our assumptions and acknowledge the complexities of discussions about human biological uh, variation. So let's ask ourselves and ask researchers, why are we so eager to discover a kind of science that supports the existence of race? What is this revealing about our own biases and preconceptions? Two final thoughts about us today in 21st century Norway. We live in one of the most democratic, peaceful, and wealthiest countries. And we will probably never have to walk through Europe and end up half dead on the shores of Italy or Greece. And we live in a society that is rather secular, in which interrogating science will most certainly not lead to an anti-science upheaval. These conditions generate the responsibility to rethink how unimportant race is as biology and how significant it is socially. To re-examine and reconsider our priorities with regards to where we invest our resources for research and medical care. Of course, it's still very important not to confuse race with other phenomena, such as nationalism, xenophobia, or religious intolerance. But we need to find ways to discuss race. And TEDx Oslo gives us this opportunity today. Let's take it further. Thank you. <laughs>